Very glad to have Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrauer live in the studio. Thank you for coming in, Dr. Ostrauer. Pleasure to be here. Well, Dr. Ostrauer, I uh, wanted to uh, start out talking about um, yesterday's show, our Memorial Day show, uh, talking about the upcoming Civil War reenactment, and we had Hornell High School history teacher uh, Mark Smith in. Uh, did you catch the show? I did catch the show. Uh, Mark was a former student of mine, as a matter of fact. And uh, I think that if all high school history teachers were as good as Mark Smith, uh, a lot of people would know a lot more about history than they do these days. Well, that's very nice of you to say. Uh, you know, I asked him a question on the uh, Confederate monuments, and his answer was interesting. He said it depends on the state. You know, the Dakotas weren't a part of it during the Civil War. Why do they have monuments? Well, they may have monuments because the Civil War, in its own way, is, you know, it's a national phenomenon. I sure. Mean, he, was, I, uh, he was along the lines of thinking of, you know, it depends on the state and who the statue is. Yeah, and I, he made the point, for instance, that why have a Confederate, a statue of a Confederate general in uh, South Dakota, uh, which was not yet a state at that time, or let's say in the state of Washington, which, again, uh, hadn't yet become a state. Uh, I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I mean, I have no idea why those monuments would be there. But uh, I, I, I have a take on the issue of monuments, which is a little bit different from uh, 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 Mark Smith. And that is that uh, most of those monuments should probably not be up. That is to say, those which are, uh, which are celebrating Confederate uh, generals or Confederate officials. Uh, and the reason I say that is that, you know, initially uh, those, uh, the, uh, you know, from, well, the war ended in 1865. And, uh, you know, what I'm going to say right now is not exactly correct. Correct, but it's mostly correct, you know, 90% correct, 95% correct, that there were no monuments to Confederate officers and Confederate generals uh, until about the 1890s. In other words, it was about 25 years after the war that we first begin to see the uh, creation of this uh, monument uh, culture, so to speak. And why did that happen? And it happened because there was a kind of counterattack against the results of the Civil War on the part of uh, the former Confederates. Uh, it was a way of reinstituting a system of white supremacy. It was part of that whole movement. For instance, it's not going to be until the 1890s that segregation, that legal, formal segregation, appears in the South. Now, it's a kind of complicated story as to why this all happens, but it was really a way for the former elite of the South, the slave-owning elite, to once again, you know, place blacks can place the freed slaves into a uh, into a clearly subordinate position. So you have the creation of this so-called, uh, you know, the myth of the lost cause. And the monuments uh, reflected exactly that. So I think that one ought to understand that the monuments don't simply exist as some kind of a, uh, you know, a commemoration of, uh, you know, brave Confederates. It was part of a political movement which had the effect of, uh, 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 you know, reasserting, as I say, a system of white supremacy. And under those conditions, I think that one has to view the monuments in a somewhat more skeptical way than many of us have. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the South, between, you know, 1861 and 1865, uh, committed treason. Uh, it left the Union. It broke up the Union. It was an anti-patriotic uh, movement. And I think that we're going to have to accept that, uh, you know, many of those monuments do not reflect American values. They reflect the value of white supremacy. They reflect the value of, uh, you know, a challenge uh, to the legitimacy of the United States Constitution and of the federal government. And for that reason, I have very, very little sympathy with, uh, the, uh, uh, with, with all those monuments throughout many, many communities in the South. How would the uh, Confederate uh, monuments and you know street names and so on and so forth end up in other places? If, you know, for example, in the North, it, um, if this was a you know an 1890s movement. Well, there, I did they have yeah, sympath a, sympathizers uh, in the North? Yeah, they did have sympathizers in the North. Uh, there were uh, first of all, one should remember that even in the North during the Civil War. 
uh, there were what we call copperheads. These were uh, Democrats, okay? They were Democrats, as so many of the people in the South were Democrats, but they were Democrats who sympathized with the South. They were Democrats who sympathized with the system of slavery. I mean, remember, slavery was a long-running institution. It had been around in the American colonies and then, you know, what becomes the United States in 1776 for about 250 years, maybe 240 years, so that there are a lot of people who, to one extent or another, had a vested interest in slavery. They had uh, uh, an economic interest in slavery. Uh, and by the same token, uh, they felt that uh, there was a, well, certainly during the war itself, uh, they were fearful of disunion, and they were certainly willing to allow the South to retain the institution of slavery if that's what it took to keep the Union together. Uh, look, I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is that President Lincoln and the Republican Party during that period took a very, very principled stand and a very risky stand. And that stand was once in opposition to slavery and especially to the extension of slavery into what at that time were called the territories. In other words, that portion of the American West that had not yet been organized into states. Uh, Lincoln took that principled position and fortunately uh, the North won the war. It was a tough war. They were up somewhere between the lowest figure that we can uh, uh, believe is that 620,000 Americans in both the North and the South died during that war, and some estimates suggest that as many as 800,000 Americans died. And that's out of a total population, uh, North and South, of about 35 million people. That was a horrendous, a horrendous loss rate. Talking live this morning with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrar. Before we get on to uh, the topic of Korea, can we fast forward to 1964, the signing of the uh, Civil Rights Act by President Johnson? Well, sure. In 1964, well, the civil rights movement, it's difficult to date it exactly. Uh, I would tend to argue that the civil rights movement was in many ways a product of the Second World War. What the Second World War tended to do was to discredit racism, certainly Hitler's version of racism. But more generally, uh, the idea of, uh, you know, the supremacy of one race over another race. And we see this, you know, uh, you know many, many, you know, black soldiers during the Second World War came back. Uh, in some ways, they were treated better in Germany after 1945, after the Germans surrendered, uh, and certainly in France, than they were back in the United States, where they had a return to a situation of racial, uh, of racial segregation. Uh, and so there was a good deal of opposition, even a little bit during the war itself, uh, to the system of segregation. But after the war, I think you see, especially, for instance, in, and I've said this before on this program, in 1947, I think there was a very, very important moment in 1947 that leads directly to the Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board of Ed in 1954, and then eventually to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that you just mentioned. And what happened in 1947 was that Jackie Robinson broke into to major league ball. Okay, for the first time, you really had a very, very attractive black American who was nationally recognized for his skills. And that, I think, had a, a, it, it kind of energized the civil rights movement in a way that would not have otherwise uh, not have otherwise been the case. By 1964, Congress, uh, with Northern Republican support, uh, 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 Northern Democratic support, and I should say general Republican support, passed the, the Civil Rights Act. And what the Civil Rights Act did is to say that racial segregation is illegal, okay? Not only on trains, but rather in any public area in respect to public accommodations all over. Not only racial segregation, but it also said something about gender segregation, about sex segregation. Uh, but from 1964 on, legally at least, uh, uh, segregation uh, was, uh, uh, was going to be buried. Dr. Ostrauer, uh, President Johnson, as we said, signed that. What was he like in Congress? What was he, he was the Senate Majority Leader, right? Well, what was he, he like been, on civil rights issues yeah, I mean, before look, he became vice president and then president? Well, let's go back to the 1930s. He broke in as a very young, pro-New Deal, pro-Roosevelt, pro-Franklin Roosevelt uh, congressman from 
uh, from Texas. Uh, he headed up an organization called the National Youth Organization, which was one of the many uh, alphabet agencies, New Deal agencies. Uh, I shouldn't say he headed it up, but he was certainly an important member of that, uh, you know, down in Texas. Uh, and eventually, in 1948, he was elected to the United States Senate. He became the majority leader, and he was a very, very persuasive, a very, very powerful majority leader. He was one of these guys uh, who could twist arms rather effectively. Uh, he was a, uh, a Southerner, and he was supportive of racial segregation so long as he represented Texas. But once he was elected president, not elected president, but once he became president in 1963, following the, uh, the death, following the assassination of John Kennedy, uh, his real stripes came out. And he, in fact, he really was an opponent of racial segregation. Uh, he represented his you know, his state, which was pro-segregation. But once he had a national constituency, in a sense, he shifted gears. Uh, he became very, very pro-integration, anti-segregation. And it was Johnson who then would help to sponsor the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And he called it a monument to the dead President Kennedy, to the recently assassinated President Kennedy. Uh, he got it through Congress. As I say, there was a lot of Democratic opposition from Democrats Democrats in the South, but not from Democrats in the North. And it passed. And the very, very next year, an even more important piece of legislation uh, was passed by Congress, and that was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Until 1965, black people in the South were prohibited from voting in all kinds of different ways, through poll taxes, through literacy tests and whatnot. You had just a tiny, tiny percentage of Southern blacks who were voting. Uh, after 1965, that changed, not only in the South, but in the North as well. And of course, that's where we are today. You know, you mentioned a few minutes ago in one of your answers, the African-American World War II soldiers. I wanted to bring up uh, Wally Higgins of Alfred Station. Fascinating story, one of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, you know that story, I'm sure. Somewhat, yeah. Uh, uh, Wally Higgins was a, he was born, if I'm not mistaken, in Rochester, New York. Uh, he was of mixed race, uh, relatively light skinned, but certainly considered back in that period uh, to be what they called a Negro. Today we would say African American. Uh, Wally Higgins once said that it, he didn't really become conscious of his race, wasn't really aware that he was, you know, African American until the until World War II. He went down, I believe, initially, I think initially, to Fort Dix in New Jersey, where he was, you know, under the uh, command of some Southern officers and so forth. And uh, that's when the issue of race became much more conscious for him. Uh, he eventually became, as you said, uh, a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, Wally Higgins uh, believed to the day, uh, to, the, to this very, very day, he's still alive, that uh, his life was saved by the atomic bomb. That is to say, he was literally on a ship, the, having left from San, uh, from San Diego, headed over to uh, Okinawa, where he would become part of an American operation that would eventually lead to the actual invasion of the Japanese main islands. And it was during that, uh, uh, during that voyage that the first atomic bomb, the one that destroyed Hiroshima, uh, was dropped on August 6th of 1945. The ship was then told that his captain was ordered to turn around and return to San Diego. And then he got another order to once again turn around and to continue on to Okinawa, uh, where uh, Wally Higgins eventually became part of the occupation force. Uh, but he has a very, very distinguished service record, and I think we should you know certainly note that on Memorial Day weekend he oh yeah he's a, a, a I, yeah, I've seen him a few times out at uh, ceremonies where he's getting awards from Senator Kathy Young or Congressman Tom Reed awfully nice guy fascinating story but the uh, the Tuskegee Airmen had largely been ignored until after 1964 you mentioned the importance of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 yeah uh, that was uh, and I had an effect on the lives not only uh, of African Americans living in the South, but living in the North as well. I did have one more question as a follow-up. We brought up Senator Kathy Young. Uh, she's pushing for legislation these days in Albany in the state Senate um, for, and it, I'm sure it'll pass, uh, to be able to give out awards to anyone who suffered uh, from chemicals such as Agent Orange which uh, some of the U.S. soldiers suffered from 
uh, during the Vietnam War. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, I hope it passes, and I hope it passes unanimously. Uh, it's long, long overdue. For many, many years, uh, the Defense Department uh, refused to accept the reality that uh, uh, cancer and other diseases were a product of Agent Orange. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why the Defense Department acted as it did. Certainly, there may have been you know, financial reasons, uh, economic reasons, and so forth. Uh, but the Defense Department simply did not accept the responsibility that finally, today, it is resp uh, accepting. Not just today, but going back to the Obama administration. Going to take a break. We'll be back with Dr. Ostrauer in just a moment. We'll talk North Korea when we get back. Selecting a nursing home for a loved one isn't easy until you've discovered Hornell Gardens Nursing and Rehabilitation. Hornell Gardens delivers the highest level of care, compassion, and commitment with amenities and activities that will enrich body, mind, and spirit. It's a place that's close to home. Stop in for a tour of Hornell Gardens located at 434 Monroe Avenue in Hornell or to learn more, call 585-222-CARE or visit hurlbutcare.com. That time again, checking in with meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Oh, pretty nice day, Brian. Uh, we're looking out over uh, some sunshine this morning. In fact, it is sunny from uh, Lake Erie right on through the Finger Lakes area to about uh, the areas west of Binghamton. Uh, we're going to be calling for a fairly sunny day thanks to high pressure moving down from Ontario. It's going to be responsible for abundant sunshine today and some warm temperatures. We should be somewhere between 80 and 85 this afternoon. Sunrise this morning was at 537. Sunset tonight at 838. So we've got over 15 hours of daylight now. It's going to be clear to partly cloudy tonight as that high in Ontario continues to build towards the northeast. The lows overnight 55 to 60. A little bit of fog may develop towards tomorrow morning. For tomorrow, we're going to be partly sunny. Could pick up a shower tomorrow afternoon, 80 to 85. Then things start to go downhill tomorrow night. Clouds will move in. We'll see scattered showers. Lows will be 60 to 65. And scattered showers in the forecast for Thursday, Brian, 75 to 80. We may actually see some of this moisture linger across the area for Friday and into the upcoming weekend. Back with Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrauer. Uh, moving on to North Korea, the latest there um, is that uh, President Trump, and this is of this morning, uh, has confirmed that Kim Jong Chol is heading to New York today for an upcoming summit. Uh, why is it that it won't be Kim Jong Un? Well, uh, the president of North Korea is not coming to the United States unless there will be an agreement, a signed and sealed agreement. Uh, Kim Jong Choi, who is coming, I believe, and I may be wrong about this, but I believe that he's the foreign minister, uh, or at least connected with the foreign ministry. And he is going to be doing some of the preliminary work that presumably should have already been done before we had this whole flap about a week ago or so, which led to the collapse of the talks. Uh, I, I find that the uh, uh, I, I find this is not a way to, to, to do diplomacy. It's just uh, confusing uh, to give you an idea of how one doesn't do diplomacy this way. When President Trump announced that. Uh, there would be a meeting between himself and Kim Jong-un in Singapore. Well, they didn't know it was going to be Singapore quite yet, but that there would be an actual meeting between the two of them. The South Korean government had not been informed. The Chinese government had not been informed. Now, when you have these other groups, when you have these other countries that are so intimately connected to this kind of a situation, this sort of a announcement can only create confusion. To a certain extent, it creates resentment, and it creates a certain amount of uncertainty. And one shouldn't be all that surprised, therefore, that eventually, within a few weeks, uh, the talks did collapse. Now it looks like maybe, maybe the talks are going to be back on track. We really don't don't know. And I think that all of us have an interest in hoping that President Trump and President Kim are going to somehow pull this thing off in a way that leads to a de-escalation of tension in a way that really does lead to nuclear denuclearization. But when we use the term denuclearization, I think that we got to be very, very careful. We don't know what this really means. To President Trump, it appears to mean that North Korea will get rid of all of its nuclear weapons, all, 100% of them. But to President Kim of North Korea, uh, 
what it may mean is that, yeah, he'll get rid of his weapons and the United States will get rid of its nuclear weapons. And you know very well that President Trump is not going to do that. So there's a lot of water that has to be, you know, kind of uh, you know, flow under that bridge before we know exactly where we are. There's another related issue, and it has to do with what kind of time frame are we talking about? President Trump has said he will not have talks until there is denuclearization. That is to say that North Koreans give up their nuclear weapons and all the missiles that they had developed uh, in order to fire those nuclear weapons. Well, anyone who knows anything about North Korea knows full well that that is not going to happen. And if that's what Trump expects, these talks are bound to fail. And if they do fail, are we then going to be in another crisis situation where President Trump is going to be threatening uh, uh, an attack on North Korea? And the real answer to that question is nobody knows. OK, are we talking about then maybe denuclearization over the course of a year? over the course of two years, over the course of 10 years, over the course of 15 years, as with, for instance, the, uh, the Iranians, or even longer than that. Once again, nobody knows. And we don't know because President Trump is in many ways ill-informed. He is a man who uh, makes policy on the basis of impulse rather than you know, thoughtful consideration. Uh, some of the most capable people in terms of what we know about North Korea are no longer in the State Department. They have been elbowed out. I think that we have plenty to concern ourselves with, and I think we've got to keep our fingers crossed that what happens in North Korea, what happens between the U.S. and North Korea, really does reduce the tensions and leads to a permanent peace between the North Koreans and the South Koreans. Well, we'll have you back next Tuesday, Dr. Ostrar, and we'll talk again, and uh, we'll see how things work out between, work out between now and then. Let's hope we get then. some answers to those questions. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for coming in.